Hello everyone, my name is Raphael Brickman and I'm the Senior Scientific Advisor in the Office of Quality Surveillance under the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. And it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. In this presentation, I'll briefly touch on some of the agency's work around pharmaceutical quality surveillance, including analyses taken directly from the 2019 report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, all of which help give us insights into drug quality and inform some of our surveillance decisions. So on the agenda for this presentation, we'll first define pharmaceutical quality. In other words, what do we mean by a quality product and what are some useful indicators of quality? Then we'll take a look at quality indicators at the site level from information gathered through surveillance activities, typically through registration or inspection data. We'll also look at quality indicators at the product level, typically through post-market product quality defect reports. And finally, we'll talk about some overarching and general surveillance activities and tools that we're developing to enhance overall pharmaceutical quality, mitigate supply chain disruptions, and prevent shortages. All right, so pharmaceutical quality. We say that a quality product consistently meets the expectations of the user. That goes for any household electronics, a car, anything we purchase. We expect it to work the first time and every time. And this is no different for the drugs we take, whether it's an over-the-counter drug, a prescription, a brand name, or a generic drug. We expect every dose to be safe and effective, meaning that it will perform as intended every time. So pulling all this together, we define pharmaceutical quality as assuring every dose is safe and effective, free of contamination and defects. When pharmaceutical quality is assured, patients and consumers have confidence that their medicine is working and will continue to work. So as Cedar's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality continue, continues to refine the identification and analyses of quality indicators, we've been publishing our findings. We look for indicators and trends to provide insights in the quality of drugs on the U.S. market. One thing I do want to emphasize is that our findings are not meant to be interpreted as comparing one product to another and attempting to define good quality. That's not at all the intent. Rather, we're looking at establishing quality indicators, which can inform us when there's a downward trend in quality. In order to do that, we first have to benchmark the current state of the pharmaceutical industry, segment it into appropriate sectors, and then compare those groups. Seeing a downward trend based on site or product attribute helps inform surveillance activities and possibly even engagement with industry. Again, our overall goal is to improve the quality of drugs and to keep them on the U.S. market. So here it is. This is the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality's report on the state of pharmaceutical quality for fiscal year 2019. It is available publicly online, and there's a reference section at the end of this presentation with a link directly to it. Keep in mind that if you just do a browser search, there's also a fiscal year 2018 report. So make sure you specify the year in your search. And the next few slides will go over some analyses pulled directly from this report. So we'll first look at general demographics. As I mentioned earlier, in order to look at pharmaceutical quality trends, we first try to group the 4,000 or so manufacturing sites into groups. And then we compare those groups to each other and to an overall average benchmark. So just to note that when we refer to sites, we refer to manufacturers of human medicine. But keep in mind that the term manufacturer does include other functions than just manufacturing the finished liquid, tablet, injectable, etc. It also includes the active ingredient manufacturer and any other release test laboratories, packagers, labelers within the supply chain. So geography is one attribute. And one of the reasons this partition is useful for us to look at is for supply chain diversity and to look for any major geographical hubs. So for example, we know that sites listed in ANDAs or abbreviated new drug applications, which are commonly known as generic applications, they're often lo located in India. And so looking at shifts and how the various industries expand into new geographies or sometimes don't can help inform agency outreach efforts. 
And looking at the application breakdown on the right, we see that almost 1,700 sites of the 4,000 sites are sites that make non-application products, meaning typically over-the-counter products. Sites that are listed in both new drug applications and abbreviated new drug applications make up the next biggest sector with about 1,100 sites. Better understanding the products manufactured at these sites, whether they're brand name, generics, biotech products, or non-application products, can help us better compare and differentiate these sectors, especially if we find that quality trends are influenced by the types of products manufactured. One way to measure quality is through site surveillance inspections. So surveillance inspections are system-based, not product-based. We look at quality systems, facilities and equipment, material handling, production, packaging, labeling, and laboratory controls. Improving the performance of those systems is typically cost-effective and reduces problems not only during production, but could also mitigate expensive recalls and market withdrawals. Over the years, many industries have recognized that quality is cost-effective and the pharmaceutical industry is no exception. So part of quality surveillance is looking at these inspections. And even though we inspect on a risk-based prioritization model, which does not include geography, we do find, however, that we happen to inspect relatively proportionally to our site inventory geography. If you recall, the distribution of manufacturing sites geographically matches well with this distribution here. However, we can start to see trends in inspection location over time. These are small changes, but we do see an overall decrease in number of inspections in both the European Union and in the United States. And alternatively, an increase in inspections in China, rest of the world, and India over the last two years. Now, the decrease in European Union inspections is heavily influenced by the recent mutual recognition agreement which allows the United States to accept inspection reports from our EU counterparts as our own. This then allows FDA resources to cover more of the rest of the world. So I wanna take a minute to talk about the site inspection score. It's a measure of a site's compliance to current good manufacturing practice regulations or CGMP regulations as noted on inspections. And it's measured on a scale from one to 10. So we take 10 years worth of inspections for every site, and then we aggregate the score by sector or by group. This could include geography, the types of products manufactured, or the manufacturing processes at the site. So the average of all sites in our inventory at the end of fiscal year 2019 was 7.4 out of 10. Geographically, we see that the EU and the US tend to have better inspectional outcomes. But again, I wanna emphasize that that doesn't necessarily mean that drugs coming from EU in the US are of higher quality necessarily, only to say that on average, there is somewhat better compliance to good manufacturing practices. But that's just part of the story and it's maybe more interesting to go deeper by application type. And we clearly see here that on average, sites that make non-application products, so typically over-the-counter products, have more trouble complying to standards. And these include homeopathic products and especially sterile OTC products like sterile eyewash or contact solutions. So with that in mind, we can then have more informed outreach targeting these manufacturers to help them get into better compliance and improve overall quality. And so all this quality intelligence is really at the manufacturing site level. Looking at adherence to compliance standards during the manufacturing and testing of a drug before it reaches the patient and consumer. But we also have some tools to look at post-market information. So after the drug is already on pharmacy shelves. And these come in the form of product quality defect reports. And so these include field alert reports or FARs, MedWatch reports, biological product deviation reports or BPDRs, and consumer complaints. When we receive defect reports, we review them and we categorize them by type of defect so we can get a better understanding of the quality issue. And this helps us look for trends, both product specific and manufacturer specific, especially because we log all defect reports by product and then try to tie them back to the manufacturer of origin. 
So one of the goals is better preparation for the next inspection. So we can understand the types of complaints tied to that manufacturer, whether they're out of trend, and what the manufacturer has done to address them. Another surveillance tool is product sampling and testing. Every year, subject matter experts look at various quality attributes and compile a sampling strategy. Now, we can't test every drug on the market. That would be too expensive, and the agency just doesn't have the resources for that. But the surveillance sampling we do shows product on the market overwhelmingly comply with specifications. However, when we look at more targeted sampling for products that we strongly suspect have quality issues, we typically do find higher instances of non-compliant samples. The peak we see here in 2016 is for a product analyzed in response to a multi-state outbreak of microbial contamination. And in 2018 and 19, the peak there was for sampling in response to the nitrosamine contamination found in angiotensin receptor blockers, also called ARBs or SARTINs. So that's where targeted sampling can really help not only confirm product quality issues when we suspect them, but also specifically identify which product or brand and manufacturer that have the problems. These are just some of the indicators available for pharmaceutical quality, and they help inform a proactive approach to measuring and improving overall quality. What we know helps identify at-risk products and manufacturers and helps inform who needs the most guidance and where to improve. Like I said, the output of these findings is not meant to be punitive, but rather to identify opportunities for improvement. So on that note, I wanted to make sure we all understand the difference between surveillance and enforcement. Our office is dedicated to assuring that quality medicines are available for the American public. Our focus is keeping manufacturers in the green. We look at adverse signals and poor inspectional outcomes and find ways to engage with manufacturers and stakeholders to improve quality and keep their products on the market. In order to do so, we've been working on creating programs to more effectively communicate agency knowledge and recommendations. One of those programs is the Site Engagement Program, which is specifically focused on helping manufacturers ensure medicines stay available to the public. Preventing shortages is a key aspect of that program, and the agency is dedicated to help in meaningful ways. The report on drug shortages, published in October 2019, is another useful tool, which examines underlying factors responsible for drug shortages. One of the root causes identified is emphasis on mature quality systems, focusing on continuous improvement and detection of supply chain disruptions. Building off of the drug shortage report, the agency is proposing a system to measure and rate quality management maturity, or QMM. This program is focused on encouraging going beyond compliance to CGMPs and proactively focus on process and product performance and reduction of negative outcomes for the patient. Now for pharmaceutical innovation, the Emerging Technology Program, or ETP for short, is currently actively engaging with pharmaceutical industry stakeholders to encourage innovation with the hopes of increasing the availability of drugs and improving the quality of medicines. And speaking of innovation, FDA continues to collaborate with our inter international partners whenever we can to share inspectional information and quality intelligence, including during the nitrosamine incident where the agency developed validated test methods for nitrosamines and establish safe, acceptable daily intake levels for impacted medicines. So I want to conclude with this simple and holistic view of surveillance. We look at site and product quality attributes and trends and patient outcomes. All of these help us better inform stakeholder engagement and outreach. The, the ultimate goal for surveillance is fewer shortages, fewer inspections and regulatory interventions, and lower costs for both industry and for the patient. And these insights and recommendations and this additional scrutiny on quality is a benefit not only to industry and regulators, but also necessary to ensure that we all have safe and effective drugs on the market. Here are some helpful references, which I've mentioned throughout the presentation. And it's been a pleasure to speak with you on this topic and thank you for your time.